Well, good evening, everybody, and uh, thanks for turning up and you're spending time with us tonight. Uh, it's our usual uh, Audit and Governance Committee meeting, and the first thing that's on our agenda and things to do is um, apologies for absence. Is anybody aware of any? Okay, thank you. Right, our next item on Labour is actually to appoint our voice chair. Um, so I am looking for nominations. Uh, nominate Councillor Richard Kingston. <laughs> well, uh, do we have a seconder? Okay, vote. No. no. Um, normally, with now, I said there are any other nominations. Ah, are there any other nominations? Yeah. Well, I would like to nominate Councillor Andrew Cooper. And is there a mover for Councillor Andrew Cooper? Is there a mover? Seconder. So, as there are two nominations, for vice chair, we'd need to take a vote and we need to ask the members to. Um, Retire while we do that vote? No, no, no. Um, to vote for the councillor who they would like to be vice chair. And we need to do that in. We'll have to do that one by, by one so that we have the right numbers. So, or well, we can say, uh, could, could you ask who um, is voting in favour? of Councillor Kingston and how many hands are raised. Yeah. So, <laughs> who's voting in, in favour of Councillor Kingston? <laughs> <laughs> who's voting in favour? So, so uh, that's two votes for Councillor Kingston. Kingston. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so who's voting for um, Councillor Cooper? Three votes. Hang on. So there are three votes for Councillor Cooper. Therefore, with uh, the majority for Councillor Cooper, we welcome you on board. Item three, uh, the minutes of our previous meeting, uh, which you obviously all read and digested in. There you go. Tick, tick. Thank you very much, mm -hmm. councillors. Uh, our next item on the agenda is actually de declaration of any interests. Are we aware of anybody got interests that they need to declare? No? Okay. Right, we now move on to the uh, the meaty part of our meetings, really, the serious bit, which is the uh, the risk management quarterly update. And tonight, that's in the hands of our assistant director of finance. Thank you. So this is the regular quarterly risk management update for the committee for quarter three of the 22-23 financial year. A copy of the current corporate risk register is attached at appendix one. The risk control measures included under each corporate risk heading have been developed to reflect the actions in the 2022-25 corporate plan. The corporate risk register has been updated by CMT and several notes and consequences have been revised and some consequences previously under the modernisation and commercial agenda have been moved to sit under a more relevant corporate risk heading, economic growth and sustainability. For example, TAM was not seen as a positive place to live or invest in and lack of economic and commercial growth. Appendix 2 provides a summary of how risk profiles have changed over the quarters for the year to date. The corporate risk, finance and financial stability has reduced and is now aligned to its target risk score. This is due to the business rates reset and fair funding review being deferred again meaning that the council will be able to retain its business rate growth for 23-24 and 24-25, although uncertainty for the future remains. The Operational Risk Champions Group have met to discuss cross-service risks and concerns remain around increased costs, supply shortages, 
recruitment and retention of staff and the threat of cyber attacks. There is also the threat of potential power cuts and further strikes in the public sector, e.g. the fire service, which could have an impact on service delivery. Discussions are ongoing with the Civil Contingencies Unit to ensure plans are in place should they become a reality. CMT also recently approved that all heads of service will be invited to the Risk Champions Group going forward, with training supported by our insurance Juric Municipal to be arranged in order to support the Council's strategy for embedding effective risk management. The committee is asked to endorse the Corporate Risk Register. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Um, yes, I think mean, it's good news that we've progressed. Uh, any questions, anybody? Just what, not not really a question, Chair. I'm just going to say I'm just going to get up and sit next to your good self, so I can give you some support. Okay. Councillor Cook. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is my monthly exercise of picking on Mr. Garner. Uh, we're a different officers come this evening, so I'm going to tone it back a little bit. Uh, yeah, just um, more of a question and a comment, just on the uh, same item. Been through the report. Happy with you know 99% of it. Congratulate the officers uh, on a good report. A really good read. It's really just the very start of it, which is obviously the uh, financial slash fiscal stability. Uh, corporate risk to ensure the council is financially sustainable as an organisation. So, yeah, straight to the top. I just have two points to uh, make out of that. Um, the first one is obviously the causes. There's a pretty damning statement within there I'd just like a little bit more explanation of, which is uh, causes of our risk to financial stability is uh, poor performance uh, practices or weak, in ineffective contract management, uh, meaning BFM has not been followed, etc., etc. I just find that as a bit of a damning statement. I was wondering if somebody can open up on that a little bit more. Stephen? Oh, I'll take it. Um, I, th I think that's um, how we present our risk register is potential causes of uh, unmanaged risks, if you like, and then the mitigations we've got in place. So that, that first column is, is the potential causes, which could mean a potential corp you know, a, a problem with a corporate risk. But we've got sound contract management practices in place, good procurement pro processes in place, which is the mitigation. So it goes from a, a gross, uh, poor uh, risk to a managed, uh, you know, uh, a managed risk approach. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm, I'm grateful for the answer, and I absolutely respect the answer. Knowing our financial officers, I know them over many, many years. Absolutely respect that answer. I just request a little bit of a reword there in the report then, because obviously it's talking about our financial stability, which we know at the present, given post-COVID, post-austerity and everything else, is got a few risks in it. It actually says causes of the problem. And the way it reads then comes across as we've got a problem there, when actually we haven't. And that's the point I'm trying to make there. Could we look to potentially a little bit of rewording within the report just to make that clear? Yes, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. Yeah, I can see what you're saying. It is about sort of the terminology and it probably needs clarifying somewhere in the report, either there or within the report. So we'll pick that up and take that forward. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I take a bit of an issue with that. Um, I, I work full time in assurance, so sorry, but um, I don't. I don't have the the experience that Danny has with regards to the council and with regards to the, the people. How do we know that, um, that 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 statement is written wrong? What evidence do we have to say that that statement is wrong? Yeah, I, I don't think it, either of us are saying that statement is wrong. I think it's just terminology around that statement. So how how Council Cook has read that statement is that we have poor performance, poor contract management, whereas the report itself is saying that is a potential cause or a potential risk uh, in the gross risk column. But because we have good contract management, good procurement processes in place, we've mitigated that risk and therefore reduced the, the risk score downwards. I don't know if that comes across clearly within the report. <coughs> 
I think for me, I think how, how would you define good contract procurement and how would you measure that and how would you put that across? Well, that's all the, 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 the you know, the, the three lines of defence we've got in place. So our internal processes are reviewed regularly and they're challenged by our external auditors as well as the internal audit, uh, as well as management. So, um, you know, if, if we had those poor contract management processes, poor procurement, procurement processes, you'd be seeing a lot more audit recommendations coming to this committee around procurement uh, for, for resolution. Thank you, Chair. Andrew? Um, yep, yeah, okay, yeah, fully accept that. We have got three lines of defence in place. Uh, first line being internal, second line external, but sort of still internal to uh, local governance, and then your third line completely external. Um, how many ac current actions do we have on the list that are related to contract and procurement? Do you know off the top of your head? Um, I haven't got the list obviously in front of me. I'd have to go back and have a look at look at look at that, and I can I can report back to to the committee on that. May I suggest then, be, until we get sight of those numbers, that we take a look at the wording in that statement then, because without the facts behind that, it's very hard to agree or disagree with what's being said. Yeah, thanks, Council. Uh, I think that's a very valid point, really. We need to quantify uh, what we're looking at and why, and then we can move forward. Mm. So, it's a very good question. Uh, I open the floor up to Councillor Cook now. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, not to labour the point, but I think Councillor Goob is raising an actually good point, that the minute we use terminology, it opens up questions. And I, I keep, every time I come to this committee, I keep saying some of the terminology we use opens up that question when it doesn't need to. I mean, I can give an absolutely phenomenal example of the quality of audit in this council. I remember a £1.3 million overspend in housing repairs in the space of eight or nine months. The audit raised, not the actual officers in the department, that led to all kinds of problems. That actually, when the solution was found via audit, was a wonderful solution, right? So there is actually a long evidence through Tamworthborough Council of audit really performing for us and really looking after every penny in the pound, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the terminology in here, just the minute you read cause of our problem and then you read that, it gets the brain going. Hang on a minute, is there a problem? And I keep coming back to this. Sometimes it's terminology we use that opens up questions that we don't need to open up. But yeah, a follow-on uh, question, uh, Mr. Chairman, if you don't mind. And I just, I'm trying to wrap my head around this because it just feels, <clears throat> certainly in the industry I work in, <coughs> sorry. Uh, losing my voice here, um, which some of you will be pleased to hear. S -s -s same uh, metric again, obviously. We look at original matrix, which was uh, severity for likelihood three. We then go to current matrix, which is severity two, likelihood three. Then we look at the target that I think now needs changing somewhat, because currently our severity is two, but our target is three. So as I sit and read this report, the severity of the problem is targeted to get worse, which doesn't read right to me. If you see what I'm saying, I know it's more complicated than that, but if you see what I'm saying, our current severity is two on the financial problem, and our target says it should be at three. So our target currently from where we sit is to make it worse. Now, I know it's more complicated than that, but again, as a layman sat here reading this, I'm sat here going, hang on a minute, do we need to adjust our target? Because surely we shouldn't be targeting as a council to make things worse. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. I see what you mean. <laughs> yeah, we can look at that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Cook. I agree. I mean, it does look a little, oh, ooh, hang on, are we moving in the right direction? So just to review and have a look at what we do is, is, is a fair comment. So I think the, the officers will take that on board and, and, and move forward accordingly. Our next item of business is our quarterly report. Update. Or well, the Future High Street Fund quarterly report update. Some recommendations in oh. the risk management quarterly. Oh, I was, sorry. Well, we, on this one. Mm -hmm. yeah. so we have some recommendations. Do we? Yeah, on the report. Yeah. 
All right. Yeah, apologies about that. Uh, yes, we do have a recommendation for that uh, risk management quarterly report update, and that is that the council endorses the risk, the corporate risk register. Can I? Yeah, can it, it, before we before we vote on that, um, can is there an, uh, another? There was another question that I did want to um, ask regarding the report. Um, I have asked it before now uh, whether we could have um, repeat actions on the on the log. So uh, the graph is it? Where's the graph now? No, I think that's. Not the one of the other ones. Was... Ignore me. I might have got the wrong item. I think it's the next one with the graphs. Yeah. Sorry. Right. If everybody's uh, exhausted their questions on that, Councillor Cook. I'm happy to second with the request of the review of the severity question. <laughs> Taken that as given, uh, well, that, shall we move it? Yep. Thank you. Right, now we move on to our um, item number six, which is the Future High Street Fund quarterly update. Uh, over to our Assistant Director. Um, thank you, Chair. and. Um Good evening, members. So this is the Future High Streets Fund quarterly update. Um, the purpose of this is to update on risks relating to the Future High Streets Fund programme. Um, there are two recommendations, um, one to endorse a report and two to endorse the risk register. So um, supporting this, um, this report today, we've got six appendices which break down the, the various projects in the programme and there's a risk register for each. Uh, the risk register is compiled by um, the consultant lead, McBain's. Um, they do that on a monthly basis and they collaborate with the TBC uh, Future High Streets Fund project team as well to, to arrive at, at what you see. So the ones that are appended are the most up to date that we have. Um, in addition to the, the risks associated with each project, we also report to Programme Board on a monthly basis, the most recent of which was last week. We um, report what we consider to be the top three risks associated with the programme. So uh, at the top, top of the pops at this point, uh, securing timely completion of third party agreements and building acquisitions. Secondly, increasing costs for refurbishment works relating to the Market Street properties. And thirdly, price increases and scope gaps, potential increased budget deficit and understanding the costs of the future High Street fund outputs. Um, that's definitely a current focus that we have. Um, I've provided an update against those three top risks, which I'm happy to take questions on. Um, and just to say that we, we do review the risk register on a regular basis um, as we move through the programme and we are now approaching the end of year two of the three year programme. You know, a number of the risks are downgraded or actually removed from the register altogether as we sort of surpass that particular milestone or, or issue or risk within the programme. Um, as we move into delivery phase, which we are just about to do, having appointed contractor now to deliver three of the projects, um, risks will then be picked up by the contractor rather than McBain's. So we're sort of in a bit of a transition where we're moving from one way of dealing with risk to another new way of dealing with risk. Um, that's everything from me. Thank you, Chair. Happy to take questions. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Cook. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. I'd like to move a motion uh, we, that we don't discuss this item this evening. Uh, there are some scary figures within the report. doesn't mean that figures that cannot be resolved. Actually, I think we should move this into a confidential item as a subgroup at another time to discuss the commercial sensitivities within it and actually have a proper debate where we can cross into commercial sensitivity without it being in a public meeting. I'd like to move that motion that we don't discuss this this evening and actually organise a subcommittee in a future date. Councillor Kingston. Totally agree with Councillor Cook and happy to second that. Any more comments? Uh, 
with more experience than myself and um, what the benefits would be to particularly in terms of perhaps some time delay in terms of decisions getting made i'm not anti it i just would like a bit more information thank you Councillor kingston for the benefit of uh, councillor daniels and the public watching um, this is a project that is so important to tamworth it is absolutely vital that we get it right and don't give any uh, opportunity for any risk for it to fail and given the commercial um, assignment of contracts and so forth it's one of those ones where uh, unfortunately um, we cannot risk the project um, being doubted and being put at financial um, instability so therefore it's better that we discuss this and challenge where necessary um, without the, uh, for once, I'm going to say, without the benefit of the uh, audience at home. Yeah. Mr Cook. Yeah, just echo what Councillor Kingston's saying. Obviously, there's private landowners involved, uh, there's private contractors involved, there's private building companies involved, all they've got the right to a commercial sensitivity. The council could be taken to court by some of the comments we could make in this room this evening. I'd actually rather protect the public purse in a safe environment than risk what we could say this evening. This is, as Councillor Kingston absolutely says, it's such an important project for Tamworth. We need to get it right. I'd rather challenge it in a safe environment where we're not going to put the council at risk. Uh, well, after hearing that and looking at the reports, I do think that the sensitivity does require a, a little bit more, um, you know, digging into the and, and, and expo <coughs> explanations. And that's not, not this is not the public place to do that, and it's not the vehicle to do that. So I would like to take a, um, a vote on that that we move a, to a private discussion regarding this 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 item. Out of further date. Out of further date. All those in favour? Thank you. I think that's carried. Yeah, it's carried. <laughs> We're good to go. Anna, sorry. Thank you very much for that. <clears throat> and you, you are free, free to leave the building. Right, our next item of uh, labour is actually the uh, quarterly internal audit process report. And that's in the hand of our audit manager, Andrew. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to present my quarterly report on the work completed by internal audit as at 31st December 2022. Progress is reported within Appendix 1 of my report, and this outlines a summary of the findings of completed reviews and the current position in relation to audits to be completed as part of the 2022-23 audit plan. And I ask for the committee to note my, my report. As at 31st December 2022, we have completed 35% of the audit plan compared with a profile completion rate of 72%. As previously reported to this committee, we continue to review the planned work with both the auditors and contractors completing the plan for this current financial year. And the matrix in the appendix to the report contains the current position in relation to the remaining audits for this financial year. I am closely liaising with BDO, who are providing our general audit services, and I forecast that we will complete 75% of the audit plan compared with a target of 90% by the end of March 2023. To provide assurance to committee around the current resourcing of internal audit, I can confirm that we have extended the contract with eTech services, who provide our IT auditor resource for 2023-24, and we are currently in discussions with BDO around also extending their contract for a further year. This will enable us to progress promptly on the audit plan from the start of the financial year, which this year was, a, was an issue in relation to trying to recruit to a post of senior auditor. Internal audit are also required to comply with the public sector internal audit standards, and this is assessed every five years by an external assessor. The last review was undertaken during 2017-18 and our latest external quality assessment was completed during December 2022 and January 2023. The draft report has been submitted 
and I'll bring both the report and the action plan to this committee's next meeting in March 2023. This will obviously detail our compliance with the standards and also provide an agreed action plan for actions during 2023-24. Appendix 1 also outlines the current position in relation to outstanding audit recommendations as at the 31st December 2022. Overall, we currently at that date had 13 high priority recommendations, 48 medium and 21 low priority recommendations which were outstanding. I can report that comparing the outstanding audit recommendations between September 2022 and December 2022, we've reduced the number of high priority outstanding audit recommendations by four. However, we have increased five medium recommendations and the low priority recommendations have remained static. I, should, I would like committee to note that during that period, we have also in, increased the number of audit recommendations that we've made and a number of audit recommendations have also been closed and completed during that period. And the table in Appendix 1 shows the overall movement of recommendations for this. We continue to review all recommendations with assistant directors on a quarterly basis and this approach has reduced the numbers over time. And, that, and this approach will continue into the future. Providing more clarity around the 13 high priority recommendations, it should be noted that one recommendation is not currently overdue and is, is in progress. Of the remaining 12 overdue recommendations, these have been, these have been followed up with my management prior to this meeting. Since 31st December, I can report that two recommendations relating to housing repairs have now been progressed and reported as being complete. A further recommendation around landlord health and safety compliance has also been fully completed. The two data protection recommendations have now been superseded by the recent review on GDPR and the updated recommendations have been put in place. And these two recommendations are basically restated. Resourcing is in place and working with the monitoring officer in relation to ensure that those are implemented. The remaining outstanding high priority recommendations continue to be reviewed by management. And again, I'll provide updated positions. I'll refer to internal audit and I will refer those through to the committee. More than happy to take any questions that you may have. Councillor Cooper. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so just going back to the GDPR ones that are restated, does that mean they have repeated? Is, is restated another word for a repeat action? They, they, are not, they are not physically restated recommendations in the, in the format of exactly the same recommendation. What's happened is that there's been changes to GDPR and data protection over time. So what's happened is that when we've done the GDPR in the last review, what we've done is we've picked up on a number on a, on a number of items in that area and then restated proper and effective recommendations to ensure that we can provide assurance around the GDPR framework. Oh, uh, thank you for that uh, explanation. Uh, just, um, just, just remind me: are they, are they going through as high um, actions? They're not high high actions in relation to that. They're low priority recommendations going forward. Yeah, that, I do. Uh, I do worry about that. I think that, um, yeah, the the, the 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 risk to the council with regards to GDPR is. Is, is bad enough. Um, I think the fact that we've we've sat with two recommendations that weren't that were low, along with alongside GDPR, um, that have been restated because of a so a, a reconfiguration with the GDPR laws. Um, I, I I think for myself, um, and to to maybe give give some gravitas behind them to get them closed out and to protect the council. Um, I think it would be better if they were to go through a, a, at least a medium, may, maybe even a high for me, because just just how long they've sat there and and they've you know and and we've they've not been dealt with, and then we've re restated them and kept them at a low. I think it would be prudent to maybe bump them up that scale. We can obviously take that forward, and I can I can review that with 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 management in respect of that to look at those recommendations. Yeah. yeah. 
Thank you. I think that's a relevant point that uh, Councillor Cooper's said that uh, you know they've been on the to-do list for too long and, and on a low priority to-do list. So if we can raise them up and close them off and just focus on them a little bit more, that would be uh, most beneficial to all of us. Uh, but going on to the general report, uh, it's very clear and concise. Uh, and thanks to you and your team for putting it all together. Do we need to move it or approve it? Yeah, I'm happy to uh, move the recommendations in the report, subject to the caveat that uh, Councillor Cooper has, has put in that that is moved forward um, as, as, as a higher risk, or higher risk, rather. Councillor Cooper, did you? Yeah, no, just, just my usual. You had a preview of my, my, uh, my question earlier when I got muddled up with the agenda. Moving, moving from one side of the room to the other really does play havoc with your, uh, your notes system. Anyway, um, yeah, very good report. Thank you. Uh, it's really good to see you, you, you keeping on top of the actions as well. You've, you've done a sterling job, it's got to be said. Um, but uh, but for myself, just to have those repeats on there, any, any of those actions that have, that have repeated through for me um, need, need a separate review. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cooper. Yes, I'll take that on board and include that in the report going forward. Thank you. Right, I'm looking for a seconder. Councillor Cooper? Yep. Right, let's vote on it. Once again, thank you, Andrew. Uh, we're now moving on to our audit committee effectiveness. Thank you, Chair. On an annual basis, I present to this committee a self-assessment of audit and governance committee effectiveness as outlined in SITFA published guidance. To inform this process, I've included SITFA's respective position statements on audit committees in local authorities, and these are as appendices one and two of my report. I've also completed the annual the Audit Committee Self-Assessment Appendix 3, which is a retrospective look at the committee's effectiveness with the SITFA guidance on Audit Committee's good practice and ask the committee for further comments on that. I've highlighted that there are two areas where I feel that the committee does not fully comply with good practice, notably the inclusion of independent member or members on the committee and also obtaining positive feedback on the work of the committee. As committee will be aware, we have been attempting to attract potential independent members for the committee and the current position is outlined in my report. The committee does also annually provide a report to full council, which is the chair's annual report, on its activities. However, we currently do not have any formal mechanisms for obtaining feedback on the work of this committee and this is an area where you may consider further work would be required. As part of my review of audit committee effectiveness, I circulated to all committee members a knowledge and skills questionnaire, and this was Appendix 4 of the report, and I would thank all members for returning those to me. This goes forward to inform the training programme for this committee for the municipal year 2023-24, so it's, a, it's extremely important to get these, do these done, and I can collate all the views in and, and develop a training programme for you. As I alluded to earlier in my report, we have advertised locally for the position of an independent member and we did have one applicant. However, this application did not meet the criteria required to be an independent member. I've spoken to other chief auditors within the county and a similar lack of responses has been received to other councils advertising for unremunerated independent members, taking on board previous comments on, from um, councillors at this meeting. It is therefore proposed to review the current arrangements in relation to achieving an independent member to the committee and firstly to confirm that the committee continue, wishes to continue to appoint an independent member and secondly to re-review the areas around the independent member, advertising, remuneration and then bring that back to committee at a, at a, at a later date. Um, if there are any financial aspects in relation to that, then we would need to recommend back to the committee and then obtain cabinet approval. I'm more than happy to take any questions that you may have on my report. 
Andrew. Uh, Councillor Cook. Yeah, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, <laughs> I hate to use the term, I told you so. Uh, you advertise these positions and pay nothing. Nobody's going to do it. It is going to need some remuneration. Um, wouldn't we be required under the Localism Act 2011 actually to call an independent panel to set the remuneration rather than Cabinet? Pretty confident we would. Yes, I think that's a, probably a fair comment. Um, and, and yeah, uh, you know, again, I mean, at, um, following on from previous discussions with, with Andrew and the team here, that, uh, you know, we've advertised, we've tried to recruit people. Um, we definitely need a person of independence on this committee. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's good and proper that that should happen. Uh, and I know that uh, following today's discussions, we're going to go forward on perhaps a different approach and actually look at how we do it, how we get another person, what's required, if we need to pay them, so be it, and how much. Uh, we're also looking at, you know, what the similar authorities do. Can we share them? Have we resources? So, the, the, you know, we've got a blank piece of paper now. We, we definitely need somebody and we need to find a solution. And I know Andrew and Stefan and the team uh, are, are fully behind that to, to, to resolve this uh, situation. Councillor Cook. Yeah, but my question still remains is, historically when we've set um, remunerations for SRAs and councillors uh, figures, an independent panel of people is called. It's not for councillors to set SRAs or remunerations. We should never be in the business of setting our own or setting anybody's. What's historically happened is three independent members of the public have been called to review all councillor allowances and SRAs. I don't think we as members should be getting involved in any way, shape or form, our officers in setting the payment for this position. I think we need to, it's about time we're long overdue of calling an independent panel of the public to review all our allowances, up or down. It's us to, up to us if we take those recommendations, but we shouldn't be setting that agenda. That is dangerous territory. So my question still remains is, are we calling an independent panel to review this, or are we just pulling a figure out of the air? Because I think that is dangerous. I agree with it, and it's quite prudent at an audit committee to say, right, when was the, you know, when did we audit? All our allowances. Steph. Yes, thank you, Chair. I think I think the the, um, the item tonight is to to make sure members still want to appoint that independent member. Which I mean, I think we're recommending that, and you're, you're on board with that. I think the next stage is we we then go to a uh, investigation, if you like, of the options available, including around remuneration <coughs> and the process that we need to go through. So we're not we're not. Um, suggesting um, cabinet set uh, remuneration or officers set it. It's a, a pro taking the approach to investigate how we set that going forward, but we will need cabinet to approve the funding as such, not not uh, not the remuneration. If you see what I mean. Councillor Kingston. Um, separate point, nothing to do with appointing the independent member. Although I agree with the discussion that's just taken place. Um, it just seems rather strange, and I know that you sent this out at the tail end of the summer, early autumn, initially, and, but as one of the last members to be appointed to this committee, um, it seems strange that we're now February 2023, coming to the end of the municipal year, and we're now at the point where um, this audit of members' skills is now just about to be assessed when the chances of this committee remaining exactly the same post may are incredibly remote as we know committee places change members come members go would it not be a good thing to do that as soon as after the may general agm meeting of the council as soon as those committee places are announced to get that audit out to those members with the with a with a timeline to say look if you're going to be appointed to this committee you need to complete that within 6 weeks of being appointed to the committee that then gives you fair chance to audit our skill set so that we can then uh, truly know the picture that, uh, that 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 we face with regards to training needs Yes, councillor, I'll take that on. I'll take that on board. I think historically, what's happened again is the fact that we we report retrospectively in respect in respect to the whole of the audit committee's effectiveness. So I, I'm doing that at a, a point in time, and that's looking back 
basically for the last financial year. But I take your point in relation to new councillors either coming onto the committee or old councillors leaving the committee and that maybe doing the actual skills and knowledge audit, as you say, should be done maybe for in 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 line for the first audit and governance committee in the June of the first one of the municipal year and I'm quite happy to take that forward in in relation to to doing that in the future um the like I say part of part of the issues then is then obviously then being able to develop the training plan doing it now gives us a bit of time to get that plan in process for the new municipal year and I think that's the other reason why it's been done previously in in sort of February March time um, going forward but we can we can certainly have a look at that going going forward because again those skills within the in the committee are evolving over time as well in relation to members being on the length, on the committee for a length of time and the skills that they develop over time and obviously like you say new new members coming in on onto that so it's a rolling program effectively um, and I'm trying to take a snapshot at a set of time uh, but we can we can obviously take that forward and we can redo the skills audit in time for the June June committee thank you Anna. Thank you, Councillor Cook. Yeah, that's a valid point that, you know, as the new guys come in, it should be part of the induction process for all of us, uh, you know, as we start a new role in whatever committees we're on. Uh, and, and it's good that, you know, uh, in audit, we've picked up a snapshot of where we're at, where we need to be better at. How can we move this forward? So thank you for your question. And thank Councillor Kingston. Oh, sorry, Councillor Kingston. Yeah. So the recommendations are that the committee considers the self-assessment uh, checklist, which you've all filled in now, I believe, uh, and endorses any actions to improve the effectiveness and its appropriate. Uh, the committee also considers the, and ratifies the approach that's taken by appointing an independent member of the committee. So those are the recommendations. Move them. No. Happy to move. Second it. Yeah. Yeah, happy to second based on the caveat that, that Councillor Kingston put in place with regards to this being shifted to a um a June um uh, such, such as such as like as what you what you indicated, uh, Chair, uh, with regards to people's induction onto this committee. It is a very um, different committee across all the scrutiny committees and, and, and committees that the council do. So we, we do need to get that sense check of people and, and what their skills are. Right, let's put it to the vote. So that's passed. And finally, we open the floor up to our code of cook, code of conduct review, and that's in the very capable hands of our monitoring officer. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Members. Um, this evening, it's to bring to the committee's um, attention the new Local Government Association uh, Model Code of Conduct. Um, the co this was partially brought to us by um, in response to a report from the Office's Office of Standards in Public Life. And one of those recommendations was to create a new model code of conduct. Um, looking at both of the models between what we have in place at the moment against the new model, there were some differences between the two. And an overview of these differences are in Appendix A. And also these were brought to a briefing for all members. With many of the provisions and concepts within the new LGA model are like those in the Council's current Code of Conduct, um, they are the same but there will be some familiar wording has been updated. Um, there is a Council uh, Code of Conduct in place. There is no legal requirement for this to be replaced with a new model. Um, the LGA is committed to reviewing the Code of Conduct on an annual basis, and this is helpful to the Council um, for future reviews. Uh, the current Code of Conduct procedures for dealing with Code of Complaints was put in place back in 2014, and with corporate guidelines, it is recommended for these to be reviewed regularly to ensure they remain for fit for purpose. It is therefore asked for committee this evening to endorse the new LGA Model Code with a review of the Code of Conduct and procedures, um, and also to include a member input into the uh, draft code. Thank you, Chair.
thank you for that. Um, I'll open it up for any questions. Anybody? Oh, well, there you go. That's a, that's a first. We need to get this off the agenda, don't we? Uh, so the recommendations is that uh, the members endorse that the new LGA model code of conduct, uh, that the council's current code of conduct and procedure in dealing with uh, code of conduct complaints and review by the monitoring officer with any necessary legal advice where required, that may uh, incorporate specific elements of the LGA model code, and welcome a new member workshop to capture members' views prior to a final draft being presented to this committee. So those are the recommendations. Do we have a mover? Yeah, I'd like to move that, Chair. Thank you. Second, thank you. Right. We'll put it to the vote. Thank you. Our next item is the Audit and Governance Committee timetable. Do you want to say anything? Go on then. So, the, you've got the um, timetable in front of you, and, and it lists out the March, the sort of the planned March items and the planned April items, which are the remainder, the two meetings that remain for this year. And there's quite a few on the March list, not so many on the April list, and some of the items on the March list were we're down as either ors for March and April, so um, I think if if the committee were content, the idea would be to move a few items to spread the load equally across the March and the April meeting. Thank you, Joe. Yes, it's always been our aim to uh, synchronise the work more effectively to save the peaks and troughs. And if we move a couple of items from March to April, or according to when the reports are ready uh, for the teams. I think that's, uh, but, you know, we've got seven items. We perhaps move that down to six and then we, you know, have a nice steady uh, activity uh, or level of activities. So if you can, can, action. can action that. Right, with that... The, <laughs> The agenda completed. I, uh, I once again thank you all for your time uh, and spending, you know, and particularly all the officers that's attended tonight. Thank you for your hard work and your reports. And your, your, you know, please pass out now thanks to the teams that's behind it. And I wish you a good evening.